back, kicking off another month, March, our ninth show. Yes, I feel like a slug because I was witnessing through Facebook and Twitter all, all the interviews you've been doing. So you must be a little bit tired, but you don't seem tired. Never. I seem more tired than you. <laughs> but see, being here with you and, and Brian and Lydia, mm. uh, it, you know, it's very energizing. Yeah, yeah. And you look very sophisticated today, I'm going yes, to point thank out. You. The little sweater. Yes. Mr. Rogers sweater kind the of thing. Mis- well, no, you'd need a cardigan. To oh, the mis- cardigan, uh, yeah, the to cardigan. To be a Mr. Rogers yes. sweater. Yes. That when everybody tunes in on our on our video on our podcast later this week, you will see all the lovely array of merchandise we have here. Our visual aid section, which we'll talk about. Yes. In a bit, it's a lovely visual aids today, mm-hmm. and we got a lot of stuff to talk about today. A lot of stuff. So we might as well just jump right in. At 11.30 today, we've got Gretchen McCourt, Mm -hmm. the Executive Vice President of Cinema Programming for Arclight Cinemas, is going to be calling in live to talk about the new Arclight Slam Dance Cinema Club. Have you ever watched films under that Slam Dance banner? I have. Okay, I've never done. Okay. I have. There are a lot of really good ones. And our good friend Annie Jeeves, you know, she handles uh, publicity for Slam Dance. Mm -hmm. So talk to the woman. Maybe I will she, maybe talk to the hook, woman. Yeah. Maybe she'll hook you up, you know? I need a little more slam dance in my life. So. Well, I think, you know, yeah. this new Arclight Slam Dance Cinema Club, it may make uh, our, our pal Phil Barrett happy. Okay. okay. He's such cool. a big Arclight. Oh, I'm an, I'm an Arclight geek as well. Yeah. I saw Raiders there when it was the Cinerama Dome. On. Oh. Yeah, so I have a really great nostalgic memory of that Arclight. I so. actually, at the Cinerama Dome, saw several... Star Trek movies. Oh, yes. And waited in line for countless hours. Oh, yeah. By the way, Star Trek, the motion picture, the first one, right? Mm-hmm. Still underrated, I think. I think so, too. Very yeah. much so. Stephen Collins actually pulled it off. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So it's been, yeah. you know, it's a very sad week for all the Star Trek fans, mm-hmm. all the Leonard Nimoy fans. Right. Um, but he did live long. He did prosper. Did prosper, yeah. And... Uh, you know, the world will always have his work etched in our memories and on celluloid. Yeah. I I really want to go back and watch his, that TV show he did. It, I think it was like an, an anthology series, In Search mm. Of. Yes. That paranormal kind of thing. I, I'd i love to check that out again. Yeah, so. he was, and he was a true champion of the arts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which is something that we need more of. Mm-hmm. But today we, we're going to talk about, in addition to Gretchen calling in we've got uh wayne fetterman's fourth international film festival we're going to hear from wayne in a moment we've got a film that you and i both love that's straight to home video from disney the late number seven in the tinkerbell fairy films this is tinkerbell and the legend of the never beast so people will hear more about gruff and about the newest fairy fawn Uh, hear from Jennifer Goodwin, who I had a chance to talk with about voicing Fawn. You also may know her best as Snow in ABC's Once Upon a Time. I always had this kind of preconceived notion that if it's an animated film and it's straight to Blu-ray or DVD, that it would, you know, kind of suck. And this movie was excellent. The, I was. It is. The yeah. production values mm-hmm. are amazing. Yeah. The animation is beautiful. The writing is first rate. Yeah. And then yeah. the music. And yeah. we will hear from... Uh, Brett Swain, the music supervisor, and Blue, song you know, uh, award-winning songwriter, singer, producer, and here he tackles his first scoring mm. and songs, yeah. and uh, in a very interesting fashion, as people are going to hear. Um, also, good friend John Ridley, I got a chance to sit down with him. We're going to hear what he has to say about his uh, exec producing, creating, writing, directing. The new 11-episode anthology on ABC, American Crime, that debuts this week. So we're equal opportunity here. We've got some music. We've got got music today. We've got TV. We've got film. And we're going to fit everything in. We're going to fit everything (laughs) in. So starting with Wayne Fetterman and the fourth annual Wayne Fetterman International Film Festival. This is a really cool film festival that Wayne, the idea that he came up with. It is this Thursday. It starts uh, the 5th, runs through Sunday the 8th at CineFamily on Fairfax in Los Angeles. And the films are all cherry-picked by comedians. His 
anybody that doesn't know Wayne, he is a comedian. He is a writer. Uh, he's been in countless films. Um, he's always that guy that you see in things. Legally Blonde, 40 Year Old Virgin, Step Brothers, 50 First Dates, uh, Larry Sanders Show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. If it's comedy, you're going to find Wayne. And he mm. taps all of his friends um, and they pick films. And they show up and they do intros, Q and A's, oh, and then some fun stuff. Are you, are most of these films from their own body of work, or are they, are they just kind of a, a wide field? Of, it's just okay. films that they are particularly attached to, films okay. that have inspired them. Mm -hmm. And there's some really interesting films. One of my favorite films, and it just blows my mind, Clown. It's a Danish film from Michael Nygaard. Mm. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen picked that as his choice of film to talk about and to... Yeah curate at this film festival never heard of it never heard of clown it is phenomenal there's a danish tv series okay. and the creators and the actors in it took it to the next level a couple of years ago mm. uh, it still ranks up there as one of my favorite comedies okay um it, yeah. it's terrific and then we've got doug benson who is who is going to be curating breakfast at tiffany's with a unique concept where he has a, a bunch of comedians and they sit there and they actually stop the film and, and comment and make jokes and, and talk about the film as, oh, it, as it's fun. going along. Right, right. Um, you know, MacGruber is going to be hosted by Will Forte, uh, The mm. Descent by Camille uh, Nanjiani, comedian. Okay. That's so, an interesting selection. But let's hear what, you know, I had a chance to ask yeah. Wayne, you know, Wayne Fetterman in a film festival, not exactly the first thing you'd think of. Here's what he had to say. You got the my, what I'm trying to do here. Oh, I think I think it's wonderful, and for comedians especially, because all of your material comes from the world around you and the influences on you. Yeah, that's a. I, I feel like you should be selling. You should be selling that festival. <laughs> like you're you're more articulate about what's good about it than I am. <laughs> How did you? How did this whole thing take shape and to still be around now for the fourth year? Well, one, there's plenty of comedians and plenty of comedians I still want to get, you know. So, uh, so I, I'm, you know, so there's, there's just plenty of comedians, you know, and a lot of times they're busy. Mm -hmm. I, for, let me give an example. I talked to Larry David, who's uh, doing this Broadway show. but uh, uh, And so he talked to me about wanting to do it as well. But he was busy last year, and now obviously he's in New York. And, you know, that presents a problem with so many comedians in New York, and it narrows his field of friends he can tap each right. year, yeah. which is why for next year's fifth, he's already talking about doing two, one in L.A. and one in New York. But, you know, the pairing with Cinefamily is an interesting pairing and yeah. not exactly the first place you'd think of to go for a film festival site. So I asked, you know, I asked Wayne about partnering up with Cinefamily. Well, it was two, two things happened. One is about five years before I did the festival, a friend of mine rented out Cine Family for his birthday. This his, it was a writer named Rob Cohen, who was a Simpsons writer and rented it out for his birthday and showed Batman, the movie from 1966, not the one from 89. So he shows that movie, and, uh, to, you know, it's friends, and we all come and celebrate his birthday, and it was just a blast. It was like, this is a cool little theater. Like, this is a nice, it's small, it's got a great vibe to it, and it's, you know, lined by those... I don't know if you mean know, those portraits of the dead. Yep. And it makes me more comfortable than having a dead silent film star stare at me when I'm watching a movie. It feels good. Mm-hmm. Very much so. That's <laughs> good. Of course. So, um, so that was the, that's how I kind of like thought about the idea of the theater. And then when I got the idea of the festival, I guess four years ago, a friend of mine was working at Cinema Family. And I said, I have this idea, what do you think? And she thought, you know, this might just go. So we talked to the programmer there, this guy named Hadrian. So Hadrian thought, yeah, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. So, you know, I know a lot of comedians just because I'm, a, you know, been doing it since the 80s. And, and I feel like I'm sort of also a bridge between, like, 
you know, I was, I did stand up with Larry David, and you know, I've done stand up with uh, Kamel. Like I've done from you know the alternative comedians to you know, Seinfeld and all of those guys. So I feel like I have a wide breadth of comedians I can choose from just people I know through the years. Mm -hmm. And I always try to like balance it between like younger and and older. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so that's how that's how I got hooked up with Cinefam. So and I yeah. and Greg is here. He has pulled up some of the the fun stuff on the the website, which about the festival, which is cinefamily dot org, uh, and it'll direct you from there to it. See anything interesting? Well, you know, like you said, the forte presentation of MacGruber, <laughs> because it's an interesting film because. It didn't do too well at the box office, yet it has a devoted following. And I think he's going forward with a sequel, actually, mm -hmm. uh, with MacGruber 2. I think that's going to happen. So it'll be in interesting to see what he says about the future prospects of that franchise mm -hmm. and the reaction and, and I guess the growth, the the cultish growth it's, mm -hmm. it's had over the years. So I find that the selections of films that the comedians have picked very interesting. Yeah. You know, as I mentioned, Sasha Baron Cohen picking Clown, um, which, by the way, anybody who shows up Thursday night to the March 5th, 7.30 premiere screening of Clown at the festival, I understand from Wayne there are going to be clown underwear given away. I don't. Uh, that does not sound too tantalizing. <laughs> I don't know. I guess if you like clown undergarments, it'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. <laughs> But it, but one of the interesting things, because, you know, I had to ask him about the comedians picking yeah. the films themselves and, you know, are there licensing issues, conflicts right. yeah. as to, because every, we know from TCM, there's always issues of, you know, what's available, what's not available. And Wayne, he's very heavily involved in this. It's not a titular thing. So he talked to me about the process of the film selections. No, they pick the film once in a while. We have like a conflict. Like, uh, for example, this year, Kamel, who's doing the last film, wanted, he's a, I guess, a horror movie buff. Mm -hmm. And he was caught between The Thing and Descent. So we looked into it, and the, apparently, the Thing was playing like at the New Art or something like that the week before. So it wasn't available. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got the Descent. But usually, we've been very lucky. For the most part, we've gotten the film. The hardest print to find so far was for Margaret Cho's picked Darling from 1965, the John Schlesinger movie. Wow. That was very hard to get a good print of that. So we, it was interesting. We sort of did a hybrid, like, print from half of it, and then we had, like, a digital thing for part of it where the print was out. So, and that's interesting that, that you know, Cine Family, that they're willing to do that to make this yeah. work. You know, I, I, I've never been to that theater. Even when it was a silent movie theater, I've always wanted to, to have gone, but I never did. And now I still haven't gone to Cine Family. Well, so, I, I think a trip to the Cine Family yeah. may be in, your, in the future. Are you a fan of that whole venue and what it means? I like it. You know, I like the history. Mm -hmm. uh, I like what they do. I don't get there often enough only because of my screening schedule. You know, it's a great location, though, right off of Fairfax. and The problem is yeah. parking. Parking. Yeah. How do you park around that whole Fairfax district? I mean, it's not... Y you pray. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You pray. That's, yeah. that's exactly what you do. So, you know, I mean, I think it's a great little festival. Mm -hmm. um, as of right now, my schedule is open, so I'll be able to go Thursday night. Oh, okay. To see Clown on the yes. big screen. <laughs> You've never seen Clown on the big screen then, even though it's... Maybe. I have. Oh, okay. I, I've seen it before, but I just enjoy the film so much. How they're going to break down Breakfast at Tiffany's with these interludes, comedic that... or intellectual, will seem seems pretty interesting to me. And, well, m the part that really interests me about the Breakfast at Tiffany screening, which is on, what, the 6th? Is that on... It's on the 6th, yeah. That's on the 6th. What interests interests me about that is what all of these comedians are going to do with Mickey Rooney, you know, when they stop on the <laughs> Mickey Rooney segments in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Right, right. Because that's just laugh out loud funny, no matter how you slice it. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but moving on to, you know, from the comedy mm -hmm. of the fourth annual Wayne Fetterman International Film Festival. Well, 
Before we get to John Ridley, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Behind the Lens is sponsored in part by the Culver City Observer. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And we're back. It's amazing that we actually come back on time when we're all in here chatting and laughing. Yes, and you paid me a nice compliment, so I appreciate your compliments. And the donuts, by the way, you know, she, she gets me and Lydia donuts and shout Brian out, every week. So Shout out to Debbie for, shout uh, out for, the, for the donuts. Can I, the can I just make a quick... High uh, caloric stuff. Appreciate you know, it. The reason why we get back on time so quickly, let oh. me play that bumper one more time. <laughs> you hear that? That long note right there saves all of us. That that long note then, at the end. Yes. There. So yes. you know, thank you for that, Debbie. Well, <laughs> then you know, then I'm I'm happy to say that composer Andrew listened to all of the notes that Lydia and I gave him on what on how how all the bumpers had to be done, how the score had to be done. <laughs> Somebody listened. Yes. That's that's amazing. Are you a big note giver, by the way? Um. <laughs> it depends on the project, probably. It depends because usually I just yeah. do everything myself. Right. Now, Lydia and I go back and forth on stuff mm. all the time, and I'll go, well, I wonder if this will work. She'll go, let me try it. Yeah. Or she'll go, well, what about this? And I'll go, oh, well, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Probably the, the person that, I, in all these years, the person that I have gone back and forth most with collaborating on stuff yeah. is Lydia. Oh. I mean, it's like... The two minds, they could be like one half of the other sometimes, because inevitably we're on the same page. Oh, cool. Good to know. So, you yeah, know, yeah. it's, it's, it's all about collaboration. It's what the, all these films are about. It's what TV shows are about. It's about the collaborative effort. Yeah. And that's the only way anything works, yeah. which is why, you know, I can't stand having you here. So, you know, <laughs> let's just... <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I yes. love having Greg here. I am thank so you. privileged and so lucky to have you. I here. now need a therapist, but thank you very much for that comment. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> that comment. <laughs> no, Fine. But you know what? You cover so many festivals. Uh, I'm sure you're, and you're very thorough. I'm sure you have a lot of things that go in your mind like, oh, I wish they, they did this right, or they, I wish they, they actually had this kind of schedule, or they, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of things that you, you would love to do. That's why I think you'd be a great festival organizer, you know, in, in many ways. <laughs> As far as just like dealing with the publicists, the journos, and and the programming as well, because you have kind of a foot in every kind of piece of that festival. It's so. it's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And over the years, you ju you just pick this stuff up, yeah, and you find out what works and what doesn't work. And sooner or later, somebody is bound to listen when I tell them mm -hmm. that will not work. Mm. Yes, yeah. I, I will listen one day. By the way, so. <laughs> I won't hold my breath. So, but something that nobody mm. should hold their breath for is John Ridley's new 11-episode anthology on ABC this week, American Crime. Mm. This is stunning. It is fascinating. Um, as everybody may know, John won the Academy Award last year for the screenplay for 12 Years a Slave. He, had this, he just directed, uh, this during the past year, uh, the Jimi Hendrix uh, biopic, right. Jimmy Always By My Side. He mm -hmm. wrote and directed it. It was his directorial debut. Um, it, John, and he's one of the most decent, nicest, kindest men in the industry. It's They are out there, and John Ridley is a shining example. I think he either penned or it was based on his book, that Oliver Stone film, U-Turn, which mm -hmm. I think was really that, underrated. That's... John, yeah. Desert film noir. So, and do you actually yeah. know one of his very first writing gigs was for Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Wow. Yes. Not bad. Not he bad. did John Larroquette show and, you know, a lot of those little sitcoms that popped up. But one of his first or second jobs was Fresh Prince. Mm. And how you go from Fresh, Fresh Prince to American Crime is something we talked about late in our interview the other day, which okay. people will get to read about on my website, movieshark2blur.com. Um but right now, we're going to talk about American crime and what he had to tell me about the process of creating this. Say, I am so thrilled at what the ABC has gotten behind you on this project. Uh, it's a little 
surprising, not just in terms of the, the subject matter, because I think, you know, we, we certainly we talk about cable and streaming and, and the terrific amount of content that's out there. But you go back to All in the Family or Maud or so, mm -hmm. uh, NYPD Blue. You know, television, broadcast television has always had the capacity to tell provocative stories. But for me, it's more about the language of cinema mm -hmm. uh, and that American crime. It's a patient show. You know, it's not a language show. We it's have a very cinematic show also. And, very cinematic. I think a lot of that also comes with the team, the technical team you have in place. Yeah, we've got, I mean, I cannot say enough about I mean, you know. DP, Ramsey Nickel, <laughs> we have a great set of editors, uh, Lou and Liza and Joanne. Um, I mean, Walt I love, did I, sound I know design. Ramsey's work well and yeah. I love it. Yeah. He did, I mean, to me, to have the opportunity to say to people, um, take the things that interest you, you know, in your departments, in your various areas of expertise, and let's not limit ourselves, no, let's not go in and say, well, we have to cover a scene this way because that's the way it's traditionally done, or, you know, we, when we go to the sound design, um, you know, if we want to drop the audio, if we want to enhance audio, you know, we, it doesn't need to play flat and mm -hmm. smooth all the way across the board. The excitement that people get when you say that we can do, we can try the things that we want to try and the excitement that they deliver to you, you know, it just becomes very much of a circuit where mm -hmm. you get energized, they get energized, and I really believe that audiences can feel the difference in the mm -hmm. show. Not just different because it's provocative, not just different because our cast is very reflective, but in how we present the material, mm -hmm. uh, it really does help people feel what is going on in the series. And the way you're presenting the stories here, you're, you're going outside the box. You're not presenting it in the typical, what people would think is a police procedural yes. anthology. Yeah. You're telling it from the victim's point of view. Very right. much like what Deion Taylor just did with Supremacy yeah. and his film, and telling it from the people that were had been taken hostage in the house. Yes, it's very much about the families, the families of the victims, the families of the accused, the accused themselves. Um, it is not, as you say, a typical procedural. It's not about the police or the prosecutors or those in the judicial system and, and actually in the filming and how mm -hmm. we do our coverage. Oftentimes you don't see the police officers. You, mm -hmm. you might just see them in, in, in passing uh, because that they are, you know, they are not. Even though they are central players in how the story unfolds, they themselves are not central players. Mm -hmm. And yes, historically in television, we follow the same police officers week in and week out, or the same lawyers. And there are obviously shows that do that, and they work very well. But in real life, that's not necessarily how it is. You know, it is that sense of getting shuffled from office to office or, you know, whereas I, I made a little bit of connection with that cop who arrested me. Now they're handing me over to this person. What is it like to be in the system? What is it like to be caught up in that system? And what is it like when you're in a system that takes months and months and months to get to something even close to being a resolution? Yeah, I mean, this is... I, I can't wait to see how all 11 episodes of this play out. I mean, the mm -hmm. basic premise of this is we have a war veteran. There is a home, uh, there's a home invasion. He is murdered. His wife is in intensive care. The decedent's parents, they're divorced, they're estranged, but they come together in a united front to seek justice for their son. There are four people that, four main suspects. Um, one is played by Johnny Ortiz, who... Everybody has just gotten another taste of uh, in McFarland, USA. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, a couple other guys. Uh, Elvis uh, Nolasco, uh, Caitlin Gerard. So we, ha we have African-American, we have female, we have Hispanic. And it, the show deals with, uh, the way that John has structured it, deals with a lot of the stereotypical, you know, typecasting, and then as the story unfolds, we're going to find out who may be guilty, who may not be guilty. Mm. And I just love the whole idea of stepping outside of the box. Right. And you can tell from the interview how invested he is on the show. Any person who mentions sound design and how it relates to the overall fabric and success of a show or a film gets definite points. So he's not, like you were saying, he's not just a writer or the creator who just leaves he's the actual director writer producer so yeah this is this is yeah. his baby cool. and you know and throughout our interview we had a chance to talk at length about what led him to this story you mm. know events in his life people that he knew 
and mm. you know it's it's really in depth, and that'll be out this week in time for the show's premiere, which is on the fifth. The fifth this week is a really busy day. Wayne, <laughs> Wayne Fetterman has his festival starting on the fifth. American Crime debuts on the fifth. And I love cop stories, but the fact that it takes a crime from a different POV, from the families, the family members, their friends, their loved ones. That's really cool to me, too. Yeah, and we also yeah. will we'll get the perspectives of the suspects. Yeah, yeah. You know, so what we typically expect and what we see, this is not Castle, this is not NYPD Blue, this is not Law & Order. Right. This, These are the people that have been thrust into the system, the media, the way everything shakes out. Yeah. Cool. So I'm very excited about this. And uh, Mark Isham does the music for the show. Not bad. By the way, Mark Isham scored... Two, has two of my favorite scores. He scored an Alan Rudolph film called Afterglow, starring Nick Nolte. It was a jazzy score. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, my all-time director is uh, Brian De Palma, and he scored The Black Dahlia. Which, <laughs> so, yeah, excited to hear the score for this one. Yeah, and yeah. and I'm with you. I love I love Mark Isham, and I love The Black Dahlia. Oh, really? Okay. We the jewels in The Black Dahlia. Oh yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. We're going to talk about jewels later in the oh, show. Okay. But right now, let's let's take a little jaunt over to Pixie Hollow, and uh, our the wonderful Tinkerbell and Legend of of Never Beast. Yeah, you know what? I I was really surprised how I actually fell in love with Fawn, the, kind of a new character in, in the universe. Fawn is a I brand new uh, fairy in Pixie Hollow. We've never met Fawn before. One of the reasons why I love the character was. You know, whether you're a parent or a child or like me, childless, <laughs> you you can ha you can actually look at Fawn and, and say, "Wow, she can act." It's kind of a weird thing because she's very, she's a, she's an explorer, mm -hmm. but a lot of her exploring can bring back harm to Pixie Hollow. So in a weird way, it's a family film, but there are some issues that parents and kids can talk about regarding, you know, what happens when you. The great thing about being an adventurer. But there's also a drawback. So, and this movie kind of lightly touches on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when mom and dad say "do not do that," there's right. generally a reason why you do not do that. <laughs> right. You know, but one of the great things, her first voicing, Jennifer Goodwin. Everybody knows her as mm. Snow in yeah. in Once Upon a Time, um, and this is you know, and to get be your first voicing to be a fairy. In Pixie Hollow, right, and be one of Tinkerbell's best friends. Yeah, I mean, come on, how cool is that? Yeah, I think it's safe to say it's a Tinkerbell story within that whole lexicon, but it's yeah. really Fawn's journey, which I thought was really surprisingly well done. Yeah. So, and of course, the, oh, well, and before we hear what Jennifer Goodwin has to say. Hmm. We are going to hear what Gretchen McCourt has to say about Arc Like Cinemas and Slam Dance Film Festival. Hello, Gretchen McCourt. Hi, Debbie. Good morning. Ah, oh, good morning to you. This is a great pleasure and thrill. My cohort, my partner in crime, Greg, is here this morning, too. Good morning. Good morning, Greg. And he is a huge Arc Light fan. Oh, thank you. So this is... An incredible pairing. We had the opportunity to talk with Peter Baxter of Slam Dance a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, and now to see ArcLight and Slam Dance teaming up here. What is this new cinema club? I know, isn't it exciting? Oh, it's it's. We, I'm almost yeah. excited about this as I am about ArcLight coming to Culver City. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we'd want to talk about that today too. <laughs> We um, no Peter um, and and the Slam Dance group have just done an amazing job. I can't believe they're in there. I think this was their twenty first year. Mm -hmm. And um, at ArcLight, we just are getting ready to celebrate thirteen years of ArcLight uh, with our first location. You know, opening in Hollywood thirteen years ago. But we've always always um, celebrated a diversity of film. We play big commercial product. We play specialty film. And Slam Dance was just the perfect partner to bring the best indie film to our audiences. And we're always looking for great stories, whether, like I said, whether it comes from a big studio, whether it hasn't found distribution yet. And we want to bring those stories to a wide audience. And Slam Dance was the perfect partner to start that. 
so very exciting. Uh, March eighth and ninth is our is our first uh, our first fest or first showings. Uh, we have one film each night, and we're going to go on monthly from there. Now, what is the whole concept of the Cinema Club? Is this something that people can buy passes to, that uh, you go see so many movies and you get something free because everybody likes free stuff? Uh, <laughs> well, it, so it's how going to evolve. Work? So right now, for our first uh, first showings, what we have scheduled for for March and then um, ongoing through the spring and summer, they're they're just individual tickets for the showings as they come each month, but we, we, we hope that it evolves into something, whether it be a membership, whether exactly what you, what you describe. So we're just, just getting started. Now, will this just be at the Hollywood location, or will it also be in your Sherman Oaks location? Right now, we're starting in Hollywood, and the great news is, is that with our, our first two films, um, The Resurrection of Jake the Snake and Bloodsucking Bastards, which are the 8th and ninth, they sold out in hours. So the response has just been beyond our wildest dreams. Um, but we are going to assess as we go along where, where we will expand. Uh, we have locations, as you said, um, we have four locations in Los Angeles. We're opening two more in L.A. this year. We have locations going into Chicago this year. So as, as each month goes on, we're going to assess how we, uh, how we expand um, in L.A. and beyond. Could you talk about the choice of the resurrection of Jake the Snake? Because growing up, I was a huge Jake the Snake Roberts <laughs> fan. And I, I, I'm not surprised that it was sold out, but what, what went into that? It into that decision making with that doc? Um, so we work, um, we work really with the, the, the slam dance team and ultimately it's Peter's decision and his group of what mm. films that, what films will play. But Jake, the snake had such a fantastic reception at this year's slam dance festival mm. that it was top on our list. And what we, what part of this partnership is how also do we help the filmmakers and one of the, I mean, talk about something that just, you know, makes my day and, and why I do this and why Arclight does this is hearing from a filmmaker how excited they are that their film's playing at Arclight. And so many of them tell me, oh, my God, this is the culmination. This is, you know, beyond my wildest dreams that my film's going to play at Arclight. And, yeah. and we heard that from the filmmakers of, of both of these films. And so both of them had amazing reception. They were at the top of their list. It worked with the filmmakers' schedule, what's possibly going on with the film as it comes out of the festival. And we were able to get those into our first, uh, our first showing. That's awesome. Well, I know that uh, when it comes to blood-sucking bastards, I know Yvette Yates is in the film. Yvette's actually going to be uh, calling in live next week to talk oh, about great. that film if she doesn't have an audition. Um, and she is a dear friend, and I cherish her. And for her, very excited, as you said, about the film playing at Arclight. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It gives us, I mean, just makes me so happy to hear that and, and, and what we hope it does for the film. I mean, that's part of what this partnership is, is we want to get exposure for the filmmakers, for the talent, and for these films, and hopefully having these showings in L.A. or making it, you know, abundant tickets available for them to invite press, to invite the, their friends and family and anybody who, who we think will really help these films along, and that's important to us. What is it about Arclight that sets it apart from the other chains, from the other theaters? Well, Arclight was created um, by, by our CEO, Chris Foreman, like I said, 13 years ago, to really make it about the movies. We want as few distractions as possible. We're a non-advertising venue. We're not, you're, you know, we have our award-winning black box auditoriums. And, you know, we want it to be about the movie. It's always a deeper look into the film. Uh, and Slam Dance, this partnership fits exactly, exactly into that. We want it to be about the movie. And um, we always say we'd show the film the way the filmmaker intended, um, it, with the highest sight and sound, the high, without any distractions. And that means if it's your first film or your, your 50th film, we want it to be that great presentation. And so many, you know, there's so many different offerings out there now as far as do you, you know, if you want to eat while you're watching the movie, if you want to drink while you're watching, you know, just all of those things. And what Arclight is staying true to is it's about the film. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I love. And I also love the, the courtesy element of the Arclight to moviegoers in a theater. They are, your people are 
so quick to respond when people are turning on their cell phones when they shouldn't be, mm-hmm. when those little screens are lighting up in people's laps, and or when some some fans are a little too exuberant. <laughs> and, you know, your people step in to make sure that the experience is enjoyable for the whole theater. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And, and it's, it is appreciated. There's so few places now where we can have an uninterrupted experience where we can decompress, and we really are trying to hold strong to that at Arclight. You know, for you, was Culver City just a no-brainer location because it's such a great site and venue, and it has such a rich Hollywood history, and it continues to be a center for, for film today? Absolutely. I mean, with the studios that are there, and, and you guys know, living and, and working in the area, I mean, the restaurants and the activity that's happened in Culver City over the last I think five to eight years has just been amazing. And I live in Sherman Oaks, and we go to Culver City for dinner now. And, and I mean, on a Wednesday night, you, you don't know. Is it Wednesday night? Is it Saturday night? I mean, there's just so much going on there. And we had our Pacific Theater there that was a you know, very successful megaplex. And our turning, you know, with what's happened and what the audience is in Culver City, turning that into an arc light, yeah, exactly, was a no-brainer. And we are, uh, we're starting the, the conversion, and it will be back up and open with Avengers on May 1st. Wow. But you'll see oh. all of the amenities you're talking about, the reserve seating, the bar, the cafe, just everything to, that speaks to arc light. Now, when are you shutting down in Culver City? to do the conversion? It's, um, it's a phase shutdown, so the actual, the full building will really only be shut down for a couple weeks. So wow. we're, we're doing some auditoriums first so that we'll still, you know, still be able to have offerings. And then when it's time to really do the bar, um, the cafe, the bar, the concession, the lobby, and those last couple auditoriums will be shut fully down for a couple weeks in April. And then, like I said, back up, um, I think, on April 30th to, to do some media days and then opening with Avengers. Oh, my God. In other words, what you're telling me is stay out of downtown Culver City (laughs) on May 1st because Because it's going to be explosive. We hope so. We hope so. Oh, my God. Are there any, what kind of films does Arclight go after? Not just with this new partnership with Slamdance, but in general. Are there any of the studios that you partner with more than others? Or are you guys pretty much open to everybody? We are open to everybody. We we certainly play all of the all of the big commercial product. Um, we are a great partner with some of the the more um, specialized studios that you hear about: Searchlight, Focus, Weinstein, and then looking for these these other partnerships like Slam Dance. We are we're just um, in the beginning of a partnership with HBO Documentaries, where a lot of their amazing docs don't have theatrical exhibition and we're going to start playing those films and and you know we we don't believe that there's any film that shouldn't be seen in just a great movie going experience and it used to be that you had to you know you had to go to a mall and a megaplex to see Spider-Man or Avengers, or mm-hmm. you had to go to, a, you know, an older slope floor um, art house to see films, and we just don't, we don't believe that has to be the case. We think that you should be able to see everything in a great movie-going environment. Not, not to sound too cheesy, but I, I will sound cheesy actually right now. <laughs> I, I have to ask, do you have, I guess, maybe a personal favorite Arclight memory, as in maybe a screening or some kind of a showing that receives such a great response and you just love the energy or, or the time and place of the, the actual screening? Um, I actually do. It was, uh, we were doing a Q&A this summer, this past summer at Arclight Hollywood in the Dome with Boyhood, the cast and crew of Boyhood. Uh-huh. And the film was opening. We certainly at that point, nobody knew that it was going to be what, what it turned out yeah. to be. Um, I'd love to say I knew it, but I didn't. <laughs> um, but we, you know, we certainly were, were a great friend of IFC. They're a great partner of ours. We were going to play the film. And, you know, to have a Q&A and be able to do it in the Dome, when we saw the response, we knew it had to go in the Cinerama Dome. We needed the seats. And so the week before this, um, Planet of the Apes had played in there. Again, to fantastic response, sold-out auditoriums. So after the fact, talking with Ethan Hawke, he was just 
beyond excited about obviously their film but he said i can't believe that this little film that you know we we hold so dear to us is playing in the cinerama dome <laughs> in a place where a special effects blockbuster played just the week before we also sold it out and one of the questions that came from the audience was for him to talk about the special effects of i don't know if you remember the scene in boyhood where he skips the rock across the mm-hmm. lake and they kept they wanted to know about the special effects. He's like, there weren't any special effects. I just skipped the rock. And, and and just to have that audience that's appreciating a film like Boyhood, a film like Planet of the Apes, the differences between the films, and to sell it out on those weekends, I, I don't think that happens any place but ArcLight. No, it doesn't. That that's one of the things that I have that and Greg knows I have championed and argued about this for years is all these big multiplexes need to take a couple theaters set them aside for these small little gems give them some legs let them have their time and let the films gain an audience and give people a chance to see them on the big screen and it's it's something that yeah it's very very difficult to do with you know when we have this industry where before a film opens we know if it's going to do well where you know there's so many films each week and that's that's really the place where where ArcLight prides itself where we're very proud that we can find these films we can play them and and we make it uh, we make it our business to to hold on to them and make sure that they can find an audience and we also you know we we brought boyhood back Mm-hmm. Gosh, I think, I mean, I'd have to go back and look. I think we brought Boyhood back three or four times. You when, did, yeah. You know, the crew, the, st- uh, the the cast and crew was available to do Q&As again in December as a, as award announcements were coming out and nominations. Then again, when it was time, we wanted people to make sure they saw these films and not just Boyhood, a lot of films um, before award season. And, and so really making sure that they can find their audience. So now considering that Jake the Snake and Blood Sucking Bastards have sold out. Mm-hmm. Do you know yet what films will be coming up as part of the cinema club that people can look forward to in the coming months? Well, I was I was so hoping that I could announce our, our April titles today on the show. Um, and I know it sounds crazy because Peter's coming on and not far uh, for another interview and the filmmakers, but we may be able to announce that in today. Um, as we get things solidified, but we are um, getting ready to announce April, and then as the films are are coming up, we'll be able to announce May and June. But one of the things that um, is very important to both of us, there's a lot of programs like the the film th- or the cinema club that that are announced, and you might hear about it, and and you see a movie or you see an announcement, and then you never hear about it again. So we're we're very committed both both Slamdance and Arclight to making the third month as great as the first month, the sixth month as great as the first month, and, and really taking care with this, um, with this festival or with this, this partnership and with these announcements that, that they're done with such care and that we'll see these sellouts as we go through. So I hope that you're hearing a lot about the Cinema Club over the next month and then as we assess where we're going to expand. Well, I can't wait. And Gretchen, please, anytime you are welcome to call us with any updates. Thank you. You know, it is an absolute joy. And I know at some point, I know Annie is going to set something up for you and me to talk about Culver City. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so that we can, you know, get the word out before. Because I've already heard rumblings in some of the restaurants and bars. It's like, <gasps> the theater's shutting down? At least now I can go tell everybody the theater is not shutting down. You will still be able to go to the movies during the renovation and changeover. Absolutely. There's just going to be about about 12 to 14 days where it will be completely shut down for those finishing touches on the lobby. But we are uh, we're trying to keep it as uninterrupted as possible. Well. I can't wait. I will not be there on May 1st. I'm not venturing near downtown <laughs> May 1st because I know it will be an absolute madhouse. No, it's going to be fantastic, but we will make sure that you come in with us uh, those on that, or that week for some sneak peeks. Oh, trust me. <laughs> I will be there with bells on. But right. the Cinema Club is something that is so needed, and I like that you inadvertently referred to it as a festival because it, it feels like it mm-hmm. has the vibe of an ongoing monthly film festival. Exactly. That's what people who can't get to the festivals, we want to bring the festival to them, and this is definitely a a way we're doing that. Oh, 
Gretchen, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, an absolute, absolute pleasure. And we look forward to hearing more about Cinema Club as the months go by. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Gretchen. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good day. You too. So we're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back and talk more Never Beast. Located in the heart of Screenland, Culver City Observer is the number one newspaper in Culver City, covering local news, politics, and community events, with sports by Mitch Chortkoff and movie reviews by Debbie Lynn Elias, Culver City Observer is the place to go to be in the know. When you think Culver City and the heart of Screenland, think Culver City Observer. When you think movies and movie reviews, think Culver City Observer. Culver City Observer, a division of Arizona Newspaper Group, is available in print and online at www.culvercityobserver.com. And we're back. I am a little bit jealous of you right now. Why? Because you have the Blu-ray for Tinkerbell and the Legend of the Never Beast. Yes. And I'm looking up on Amazon right now at all the special features because I will actually plunk down some cold hard cash which I don't have right now but I will plunk it down for, for this Blu-ray that's, and that's just it this yeah. film is so cool and as people will get to see when they tune in and watch the video of today's show uh, later mm. this week you know we have mechanical fairies Fawn is now in in her Barbie-ish in her Mattel kind mm. of fashion with her little wings flutter and light up and we have for the young, for the young girls we have we have fawn, a stuffed fawn that they can sleep with. And, of course, we have gruff. We have my favorite, gruff. And, of course, limited edition, complete fairy sets of all the fairies in Pixie Hollow. <laughs> so there's a lot of cool, cool toy stuff that goes with this movie. I am a fawn fan. I, I'm a huge fawn fan, actually. Were you into the whole storyline as, as far as her kind of challenge of act, whether to venture venture forth and explore absolutely or, or stay in pixie hollow for the safety of her fellow family and yeah, neighbors the heck with safety oh, of really? family and friends <laughs> yeah let's go adventure let's Let, go explore let's go find gruff right okay. and you know this is kind of the experience yeah. that jennifer goodwin had giving fawn a voice because this was a, in many ways a challenge for her to, venturing forth into a new realm mm. and here's what jennifer had to say so how fun is it to be Fawn the Fairy? This is fun as it gets. I would very happily um, retire from live action movie making and just do this. I mean, there's nothing better. There really isn't. It's hard. I think it's harder than live action. The hours are a lot better, but <laughs> but um, it's, it's more challenging, but it's more liberating at the same time. There's something about only having your voice to define a character that is seemingly very limiting. I didn't realize how much I depend on, you know, an eyebrow when I'm doing live action work. And the first couple of passes I made at the film were really produced lousy results. I hated what I had done, and I would have fired me if I had but um, they were nicer than I had. And uh, gave me a chance to undo everything I'd done when I sat down with them after having seen um, an animatics version of something that we had recorded about three years ago. And I said, I really think that I made like all the wrong choices and I'm not, I think that everybody else has made the right choices and that I haven't lived up to the quality of the writing and the quality of the directing and what everyone's vision is. And I need to find a way to liberate myself because I realized that what I'm used to doing is so controlled and that I am used to using so many different parts of myself to express. And so now only having my voice, like my voice, I always have thought of myself as a very animated kind of person. But the truth is, if you, if you take away everything external, just listen to my voice, you don't have, for instance, a lot of musicality, not in the way that you need for a character like Vaughn. So I kind of had to start over and put myself through like my own acting school. That's that's dedication to your craft right there. Definitely. I was so ignorant. I had no idea she voiced Fawn until I went on imdb.com afterwards and I was absolutely gobsmacked actually. Yeah. I thought it was some kind of maybe 14 or 15 year old 
Disney pop star doing yeah. a really great job, but kudos no. to her. Wow. Yeah. I think Jennifer does an amazing, yeah. amazing job. And I hope that for the next Pixie Hollow Tinkerbell movie that they bring Fawn back. I hope she's I, back. I, yeah, yeah, I really hope so. But, you know, something about this this film, the music was so important. And, it's, and the music is not your typical orchestral scoring that was done. Music for Tinkerbell and the Legend of Never Beast, music supervisor Brett Swain, uh, and Blue who is one of the coolest guys mm. out there. You know, I mean, he does everything. But so I had a chance to talk to both of them about various elements of coming up with sound, coming up with a sound for Gruff, um, without using specific musical instruments that we think of mm. when we think of musical instruments. And here's what Brett and Blue had to say. As we talk about themes for the film, we identify characters, we identify, in this case, the storm, you know, who's going to have their own themes, what are those themes going to sound like. In most cases, they're melodic, you know, they're, they're little mini tunes that, that we create for these characters to identify them. But in this case, Blue came up with um, instruments so that the minute you heard them, you would know that these characters are associated with these sequences. So um, Steve Loader, the, the director, wanted something different. He wanted sounds that were different, not only to our uh, Tinkerbell and Fairies franchise, but to film. You know, because we had established a, a sound for Pixie Hollow in the prior films, and Steve was taking us to a place that we hadn't been in Pixie Hollow and the Never Beast, and, and that part of Neverland. So um, Blue had the task of coming up with unique identifiers for some of our characters, and Blue's going to talk a bit about that. In addition to producing all the songs for the film and writing some of the songs, and obviously I got to sing uh, the duet with Katie Tunstall at, at the end of the film, um, I was at a certain point also tasked with coming up with what I'll call a, a, a sonic palette, a sort of a, a color scheme sound-wise for the whole film. And just exactly what is a sonic palette? Blue elaborates on that okay. for us. I took it upon myself to try to come up with ideas for the film, um, you know, that were whole, wholly new rather than using typical sound libraries and MIDI, you know, things which are used in a lot of scores these days or electronic elements. I wanted to go with a purely organic palette, but yet still something that wasn't a real instrument. And uh, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to concentrate on percussion because uh, Gruff, obviously, it was my directive from the very beginning. We, we got to come up with something great for Gruff. What is his sound? And obviously we ended up finding out uh, through the film that he's an ancient creature. He's been around for at least thousands of years um, since ancient fairy lore, and he's probably going to be around for thousands of more years. And, you know, when we think of instruments, um, we think of traditional percussion instruments as being some of the first instruments. Probably the first instrument that man ever played was a percussion instrument of some sort. Um, but I didn't want to use, and I actually did a lot of research um, into traditional percussion instruments from around the world and found a lot of really interesting things there. But the hard part about a lot of those instruments is that um, they, they, can, they put you in a very particular place. I didn't want to peg this world to any outside place. You know, there was a sound that we've established in Pixie Hollow from the prior films. So whatever Blue came up with needed to, you know, work on its own as well as with our established sound of Pixie Hollow. So, you know, it, it, it was a unique challenge. So, you know, one of my first directives, obviously my main directive was to come up with something for Gruff. And uh, one of the first things that I ended up finding was these beautiful pots. These are just regular planters, you know, that I bought at the uh, hardware store, hardware superstore or whatever. 
And uh, you know, these ones that you use outside, they all have a little hole in the bottom so that, you know, the water can drain out when you put the plastic pot in there or however it works. I'm not, it was really wonderful because then we could go around and, and uh, you know, listen to all these different pots and it gave us this huge palette and I'll, I'll, I'll play them here for you so you can hear them, but. As you can hear, they have pretty distinct pitches to them. And with a lo very large palette, which we had of all these different pots, it gave us a huge, really shocking array of, of tones. A toy, I actually had these when I was a kid. Um, they go by the trade name Whirly Tubes, although I think the technical name for it is a Karuga phone, um, having something to do with the corrugation or something. But uh, I mostly used these to whack my cousins when I was a kid. But, uh, they but probably leave a good mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't leave a mark. That's oh, that's great. Right. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but uh, but I, I think they sound um, kind of like a, a high, like operatic soprano, but also sort of like a wind whistling through the trees sort of thing. You can really hear the air going through the instrument. <coughs> so this is the instrument that we used to describe the storm, and the director Steve was adamant that the storm itself was actually a character in the film. Um, and then the towers as well, you know, the big towers, because they're sort of a part of the storm, they, uh, you know, they uh, are the sort of a presaging of this, the storm that's to come. Um, so I'll give you a quick idea of what these sound like. I found that if you carefully cut them to different lengths, you could get different pitches out of them. So they were actually ended up being a lot more versatile than, they, than I thought they would be. But you'll notice in the film, when you first see the towers and all that kind of thing, or when you see the storm, you, you hear this instrument a lot, and it immediately you know, pulls you into that particular thing. And we did it again. Yeah. We can't even get to everything. We nope. have so much stuff. So everybody's going to have to wait till next week to hear about Cinderella's Glass Slipper and Swarovski Crystals, 20,000 of them, mind you. <laughs> so, and watch the show later this week. You can see what a Karuga phone looks like, yes. which is the coolest thing in the world, and every kid in the world should have one to hit their brother and sister with. So, that's it for today. We will be back next week. <laughs>